السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد أبا كبر Okay, good. At least one thing I remember. Um, inshallah ta'ala, my intention today is to cover, as was mentioned, ayahs number 142 to 144 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And what I'd like to do now is get right into the subject, just immediately begin and give you a little bit of an introduction, uh, and why these ayat are so important. Surah Al-Baqarah as a whole, Rasulullah sallallahu described in one place, لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَنَامٌ وَالسَّنَامُ الْقُرْآنِ الْبَقَرَةِ Everything has a peak and the peak of the Qur'an is Baqarah. It seems like it has all different kinds of subjects, but actually if you look at, it, look at it carefully, it's building a very powerful argument. And one of the most powerful arguments that Surah Al-Baqarah makes is the argument of the identity of the Muslim. So when we talk seriously about the identity we have as a, not just as an individual, but as an ummah, then this is the first and foremost surah that we have to look at. And so I want to first illustrate that there are three main components as far as history before we get to these ayat. And by the way, I'll tell you what these ayat are about in a minute. The first, the earliest story mentioned in Baqarah is the, is the story of Adam alayhi salam. And the battle between, essentially there are two camps. There's the side of the angels and there's the side of the, the shayateen, right? And Adam alayhi salam is right in the middle. And the children of Adam will have to choose whether they will choose the side of the angels or the, the side of the shayateen. That's what's going to have to happen. Then the story moves forward and Allah gives us a very long history of the Jewish people, the Banu, Banu Israel. And as he mentions that story, he basically describes how they were given revelation and they were told how to ch choose the right side, but ended up following the way of the shayateen also literally in the middle of the passage. They literally ended up following the ways of shayateen. And, and they ended up not appreciating the guidance that Allah had given them. Now, it's important to note that Adam salam was chosen over all humanity. And actually over all of creation. Adam salam's choice is a choice over all of other creation. And among his children, this family, the children of Israel, were chosen among all other nations and all other people. So first and foremost, you have the highest choice, Adam. And from within his children, you have the highest choice, Bani Israel. And the, the choice of Adam was to demonstrate what it means to obey Allah by choice. Angels don't have a choice. Shayateen have a choice, but they failed. Adam alayhi salam is supposed to have a choice and succeed. He's supposed to demonstrate that to the, to all, to, before Allah Azza wa Jal. As a nation, Banu Israel were supposed to show all the other nations what it means to obey Allah and get the best of this world and get the best of the next world. The, the role of the Israelites, the reason Allah gave them prophet after prophet after prophet, the reason Allah preferred them is not because they are racially superior. It's not because of their race, it's not because of their language. The reason Allah chose them is because they were supposed to demonstrate to all the other nations of the world what it means to obey Allah. So all other nations of the world could see that model and be impressed with that model and come to the way of Allah. So you know how we have da'wah as an individual? One person talks to a Christian or a Jewish friend or a Hindu friend or a Buddhist friend and is telling them about Islam. That's da'wah as an individual. But there's also such a thing as da'wah as a nation. When a nation has the, you know, is built upon the model of Allah's teachings, then the existence of that nation itself is da'wah itself sends a message. And if one person can make da'wah to a thousand people, can you imagine what the da'wah of a nation looks like? It can affect the entire world. If that model exists, it will affect the entire world. This was their job, but they failed. And when they failed, Allah reminded them that this job of theirs is not just because they're children of Israel, they're actually children of Ibrahim. So the next story in the surah is not the Banu Israel, it goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Because they were supposed to be like their father, Ibrahim. And so here what I'd like to share with you is another continuation. It's very simple to remember, I hope inshallah ta'ala you'll keep it in your mind for today's discussion. The first story was which one you tell me? 
Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi was, Adam alayhi salam was tested, yes or no? He was tested. Banu Israel is the second story, right? Were they tested, yes or no? They were tested. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the third story. Are they tested? Is he tested, yes or no? Yes. Three stories, and in all of them, the main characters are tested, yes? In the case of Adam alayhi salam, did he pass the test or did he fail the test? Huh? It's okay, you can say it, I'm not gonna kick you out. He failed the test. They ate from the tree. But he can make it up later by doing istighfar, right? He apologized, because that's, that's the way of humanity. We'll, sometimes we will fail and we'll ask Allah to, you know, for an apology, we'll make istighfar and we can come back, right? That's the first story of a failure, but then you can recover. The second story is the Israelites. Did they pass the test or they failed the test? They failed the test and they didn't apologize. There's a difference between Adam and Banu Israel. Adam failed but apologized. The Israelites failed but they refused to apologize. Actually they became even more arrogant. Instead of becoming humble after failing, they became even more arrogant after failing. What's the third story that I mentioned? Ibrahim. Did he, did he pass the test or fail the test? He passed all of them. So you have three scenarios. You can fail and make it up. You can fail and become worse, or you can pass. Three tests. And then, in this surah, the next story is the story of this ummah. From here on, it's talking, this surah is talking about this ummah, us, the Muslims. And the, the question hasn't been answered, did we pass the test? Did we fail the test? Are we gonna recover from the, well, the reason we're mentioned here is because now three case studies are there before us. We hope to be like Ibrahim alayhi salam, that we pass the test. In case we fail the test, we hope to be like who? Adam alayhi salam. Because if, in case we fail any test, we should make istighfar and fix ourselves. We hope that we never become like who? Banu Israel, who pass the test and become arrogant and keep failing. Or fail the test and become arrogant and keep failing. Now it's our turn to be tested. And our first, now that we are the chosen nation, by the way, Banu Israel were removed from this position, and now that we are supposed to be the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam, we're supposed to carry that responsibility, we are now given that title. We are now being transformed. And in these ayat, we're gonna see the phrase, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً That is how we made, we made you into an ummah. You are now the nation. But before I get to that, just these few elements, the first of them, we, the Muslims see themselves as the continuation of the same battle that started with Adam alayhi salam. The battle between the side of the angels and the side of the shayateen. We are actually the final soldiers in that battle. That's what we are. That's the, that's the thought of a Muslim. Then, we are supposed to be the people, we recognize that we are not the first ones to be chosen. There was a nation who was chosen before us. And what happened with that nation? They were replaced. Replaced by who? Us. If Allah did that once, He can do it? Again, إِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you turn away, if you fail, He will replace you with a nation other than you. And they won't be like you. He told that to us. So we don't say, oh, Bani Israel, their turn is over, now it's our turn. Yes. Uh-uh. Because if you think you're special and I'm special, and that's it, we have the special label, then we are no different than who? Bani Israel. That's part of our identity. We realize that we are, rep we are replaceable. We are entirely replaceable. Allah will take nations today that are Christian, Hindu, Jewish, other nations, and they may become the Muslims of tomorrow. They may do that. And Allah has no problem doing that. And He's done it before. You know, يَأْتِ بِقَوْمًا آخرين. He'll bring another nation in your place. He'll bring another people in your place altogether. So the thinking of the Muslim is that we are not irreplaceable. We are not permanent. We don't own Islam. Islam owns us. We don't own it. The third piece of our identity is that we are actually, this is very important, we see ourselves as the practicers of the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is really important. The name of our religion Islam actually comes from Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
ربنا واجعلنا مسلمين لك ومن ذريتنا أمة مسلمة لك إذ قال له ربه أسلم قال أسلمت لرب العالمين هو سماكم المسلمين من قبل وفي هذا over and over again in Quran you learn that the, the idea of Islam of complete submission to Allah unconditional I will obey Allah no matter how difficult the commandment that is the legacy of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam our religion is actually one of the names of Islam in the Quran is Millata Abikum Ibrahim, the religion of your father Ibrahim. This is extremely important. Actually, even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we say this is the religion of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we say that. But even Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is told, فَاتَّبِعْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا You follow the religion of Ibrahim. You must follow the religion of Ibrahim. This is not a lecture about that, but in just a couple of minutes, I want to give you a quick, quick, quick picture of how much we are the religion of Ibrahim. How many pillars in Islam? It's not a hard question, guys. How many pillars in Islam? Five. Shahada goes back to Ibrahim. La ilaha illallah, oneness of Allah. Everybody's clear why that goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? No confusion why Hajj goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Is anybody confused about that? Hajj we do at the house built by Ibrahim. Every ritual is tied to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then we make salaf, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُسَلَّى Safa and Marwa goes back to Ibrahim. The slaughtering of the animal goes back to Ibrahim. All of Hajj goes back to who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. The salah. Who made the dua? رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي Who made that dua? Ibrahim alayhi salam made that dua. You know, make me the one who establishes the prayer. Then, okay, then the, what's left is zakat. You know, Ibrahim alayhi salam's son is Ismail. كَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاتِ He used to tell his family to, to pray and to give zakat. Where did Ismail learn his religion from? From Ibrahim. Even zakat goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Only one thing left, Ustad. How are you going to do Ramadan in Ibrahim? Because Ibrahim alayhi salam didn't have Ramadan. Why do we celebrate Ramadan? Why? I know it's a hard question, but I'll wait for you. Let it get awkward, it's okay. Because of Qur'an. Qur'an was given to who? Rasulullah We celebrate Ramadan because Qur'an came, right? Qur'an came because of the dua of Ibrahim. رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّهِمْ Master send a, a messenger among them who will recite your ayat. Which ayat? Qur'an. He'll teach them the book. Which book? Quran. And finally the dua was answered when who came? Rasulullah came. And we celebrate the coming of the Quran with what month? Ramadan. And actually in Ramadan we celebrate the answer of Ibrahim's dua. That's what we celebrate. Five of the pillars go back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. All five. It's, this is the religion of Ibrahim. And that's a very important thing to understand. Extremely important to understand. So now when I've, I've given you that, Let's take a step forward. Let's, let's not think about this in terms of religion for a second. Let's think of it in terms of a new nation. A new nation. A new nation needs uh, Independence Day. Kind of a celebration of when the nation was formed. A new nation needs a capital, right? A new nation needs a constitution. A new nation needs a name. What's the name? Muslimin from Islam. Comes from who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. What's the constitution? The book of Allah, the Quran. Now, this surah has given us the name Ummah, Ummatan Wasata. We've been given a name, and we've given the name, been given the name Muslim. Later on in the surah, we're going to be given our Independence Day, or actually Independence Month. What is that? Ramadan. That's part of us becoming a new nation. We used to fast on the same days as the Jews, but now we're gonna fast on our own days, which is the days of Ramadan. Then the, the, the capital of faith was considered Jerusalem. But now there's a new capital. What's the new capital? It's Mecca. It's the Kaaba. And that's what we're gonna learn about today. Because a new nation needs a new capital. So in every sense, we, a new nation is being formed that is separated from the previous nation. Which was the previous chosen nation? Banu Israel. Okay? Now, as this shift is happening, one last thing. Thousands of years ago, Ibrahim alayhi salam, in this surah, a few ayat ago, he made a dua standing next to his son Ismail. 
He made a dua, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ out of our future generations, at least give us one ummah that is Muslim. And that dua, when he made it with his son, thousands of years later, Allah told it on the tongue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He tells us in these ayat, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا That's how we made you an ummah. As if to say, finally I have answered the dua of Ibrahim, you made, he made you into an ummah. We, sitting here, are actually the answer of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, among my children, give an ummah that is Muslim. And then, you know, ummatan muslimatan lak, subhanallah. So this is just a little bit of a history of why these ayat of the change of the qibla are important. They begin with a very strange phrase. Allah says, سَيَقُولُ سُفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ Fools among the people are going to say, and this the idea of fools, let's dig into that a little bit. This is the third time in Surah Al-Baqarah Allah mentions fools. The first time it was mentioned, أَنُؤْمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَحَا Should we believe like the fools believe? And the second time, it was actually about Ibrahim alayhi salam, وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِحَ نَفْسَهُ Who would turn away from the religion of Ibrahim except somebody who fools himself? And now Allah says, the fools among the people will say. Fools among the people, well who are the people? The, the people around the Prophet ﷺ, they are Muslims, they are hypocrites, they are Jews, they are Christians, even by extension you can say they are mushrikeen. And Allah says among all the people, the most foolish among them, the only ones Allah is willing to call fools, they are going to say the following. What, are they, and what in the world are they going to say? مَا وَلَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمْ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا What turned them away from their qibla? What turned them away from their direction? So let's understand this history briefly. There are lots of different interpretations. I'll share with you the one that I find the most compelling, easy to understand and convincing, okay? Rasulullah according to some narrations, when he originally, it wasn't explicitly stated, but his practice was to pray towards Jerusalem. Even when he lived in Mecca, he used to pray towards Jerusalem whenever possible. As a matter of fact, when he would stand at the Kaaba, some narrations tell us, he would stand in a way that the Kaaba is in front of him, and also Jerusalem is in front of him. He could line them together. And that's how he would pray. Okay? The problem was when he moved to Medina, Medina is almost, you could say in a way, in the middle. Okay, without getting too technical about the map, it's in the middle. So you cannot pray now with Jerusalem in front of you and the Kaaba in front of you also. That's not possible. When you're going to face Jerusalem, your back will be to the Kaaba now. That's what's going to happen. But the Prophet ﷺ still prayed towards Jerusalem. Even when he moved to Medina, he prayed towards Jerusalem. Now who prays also towards Jerusalem? The Jews. They also pray towards Jerusalem. And it's very clear that in, the, it's, in their public speeches, they don't think Islam is the truth. Publicly they say Islam is made up, he's not a prophet, he's a liar, all of these things. Privately, it seems to be the case that they recognize more and more that he's the, Allah's prophet. And it became more and more clear to them that, that he is it. And Quran keeps actually illustrating that they're hiding what they know. They hide the truth. لَيَكْتُمُونَ الْحَقْ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ They hide the truth and they know. So publicly, no, 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 no. Islam. Privately, oh my God. Like there's a famous incident I mentioned in the Baqarah series of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He walked into a, a you know, where they study. The Jews, the, 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 the rabbis, they study. In a synagogue you can say. He walked in to a synagogue. And he just started talking to them. He said, why don't you like Islam? What's your problem with the Qur'an? And he says, D -d -d you know they said? He keeps exposing all our secrets. <laughs> like things they've been hiding in their book, Qur'an keeps exposing over and over and over again. But the thing is, at least publicly they were telling the world, this religion is false. If, let's just, I want you to understand this scenario. If you think, if a Jewish friend of mine thinks that I have the wrong religion. Islam is wrong. Whether I pray towards Kaaba or I pray towards Disney World, 
or I pray towards California. Who, why does he? He doesn't care. It's not his problem. I could pray upwards or downwards or backwards. I can pray on my head. He, well, it's no big deal. It's wrong anyway. Why should he care? When the Prophet ﷺ decided, and Allah revealed to him silently without telling him it seems, to start praying towards the Kaaba. When he starts praying towards the Kaaba, the Jewish community is very offended. Wait, 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 what? Why are you... Pray towards Jerusalem, why are you changing direction? If this is not your religion, why do you care? You're not supposed to care, right? But the fact that they were offended and started making a joke out of, hey, how can they just change their direction? That exposed something. It exposed that they know that this is the right religion. And it also exposed that they know that so long as he's praying towards Jerusalem, Allah is still not that angry. I mean, he's angry, but he's still, I mean, he's praying in the same direction. He's fasting on the same days, you know. So we're still kind of the same, it's okay. We can, we've messed with prophets before, we can mess with this one, no problem. But when the capital is changed, it's like Allah is saying, this is a new nation, you're not part of it. And the only way you can be part of this nation, you have to change your direction too. And they got upset, and they, what they were hiding all along, came out and they said, مَا وَاللَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمُ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا What turned them away? From the direct, their direction, it was their direction. Qiblatihim, the idafa suggesting, come on guys, that's, that's your direction. Do, do it in, towards Jerusalem. The one that used to be committed to. What turned them away from the direction, their direction that they used to be committed to? When they said that, it foolishly explained and made it public that they were hiding the truth. And thus they are the fools among the people. You understand why they're foolish now? They couldn't hold it in. Sayaqulus and Allah says Sayaqul, meaning they will say. Allah even called it, they're going to come and say. And He doesn't say who they are, He just says fools. He doesn't say Sayaqulul Yahud or Sayaqulul Nasara or Sayaqulul Mushrikul. He didn't, he didn't say that. He will say, fools will say this. And you could even argue that perhaps Sahaba, when they first received these ayat, there's no knowledge of who's gonna come and say this. Ma wallahum an qiblatim. And then later on, the rabbis show up and say, hey! What's going on here? Oh, fools, I see. <laughs> you know, Allah told us about you guys. You know. Mawallahum an qiblatihim ulati kanu aliha. You know, Fayufham anahu la safiha gairahum ala wajhil mubalaka. It's as though Allah is saying there's no bigger fool than them. That's what it implies. But what Allah says in response is so beautiful. Pay, pay attention to this part. What should you say to them? Qul lillahi al mashriku wal maghrib. Tell them Allah owns the east and the west. Tell them Allah owns the east and the west. You know why that's important? It's important because إِنَّمَا الْعِبْرَةُ لِمْتِثَالِ أَمْرِهِ The only important thing is that you obey Allah. The direction is not important. What is important is that you obey Allah. Even before these ayat. What Allah said before, is وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ When he was talking about Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ Allah owns the east and Allah owns the west. فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Wherever you may turn, wherever you may turn, wherever you are in the world, that is where the face of Allah is. That wasn't even an ayah about the qibla or the haram or nothing. Allah said, you will find Allah wherever you are. Why, for the Jews, if you're not praying towards Jerusalem, then it's, it's like kufr. For the, now, we turn towards the Qibla, and they say, how can you? Allah is over there! <laughs> and now Allah is saying, actually, Allah is not over there. Allah owns the east and the west. Wherever you are, you'll find Allah. Wherever you are. In Allah wasi'un alim. Allah is vast, all-knowing. You know, for children sometimes, our kids, we talk about the Kaaba, we have pictures of the Kaaba at home, we have little toy cube Kaaba things, you know, or they have school projects where they make the Kaaba, and we call it Allah's house. Now for a child, what do they think? Allah lives in there. You know, Allah only needs one bedroom, He doesn't know extra rooms in the house. You know? Now a kid, a three-year-old can think like that, no problem. But you know sometimes, we don't realize, even adult Muslims, even adult Muslims, Muslims will go to the Kaaba, 
and they'll go take a scissor and tear out a piece of the ghilaf, stick it in their ihram, and then bring it home and put it in their house. You know? Is that piece of cloth have any value? Is that worthy of worship? Is it sacred? No. You know what's sacred? The command of Allah to pray in that direction. The most sacred part of the Kaaba is Hijr Aswad, yes? The most valuable part of the Kaaba, Hijr Aswad. Umar bin al-Khattab looks at Hijr Aswad and he says, I know you're just a rock. La tanfa wa la tadar. You don't benefit and you don't harm. And I'm only kissing you because the Prophet kissed you. That's it. But you're just a rock. Like before he kissed the rock, he said, hey, you're just a stone. <laughs> Are we that clear about that? It doesn't look like it when you go to Kaaba today. It looks like people are obsessed with stone. People are crazy about a stone. And the lesson Allah is teaching here, is that your loyalty is not to the, that stone. Your loyalty and your worship is to Allah. لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Do you understand this point? It's a very heavy point. It could be that somebody's... Uh, uh, this is a controversial thing to say, but I have to say it because it must be said. It could be that somebody is at the Kaaba and they still don't know what Tawheed is. It's, they still don't know what it means to worship Allah. What it, what it means to worship Allah. We are not there to worship the Kaaba. We are there to worship Allah. That's why Allah says, Allah owns the East and Allah owns the West. And so, يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ This is one of my favorite phrases in the ayah. يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ He guides whoever he wants to a straight path. Very easy translation, he guides whoever he wants to a straight path. But look at the, the deeper meanings inside here. First of all, what is important is guidance. And guidance isn't just which way you pray, guidance is what are you going to do, what are you not going to do. Wait, hold on, that's too, inter that's too interesting for some of you, so I'll stop. Hold on, let them finish. They're almost done. You guys done? Okay. Because a lot of people got interested in that, so I thought maybe I'll let you guys get your entertainment out of your way and then we can continue. Okay, you're, you're with me now again? We're back? We're good? Okay, okay. So, يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ You know, Allah guides anybody who wants to a straight path. Did you know about Jerusalem? I was doing some research with some of my colleagues into the, you know, we pray, they used to pray towards Jerusalem. It started, the practice allegedly starts with the Temple of Solomon with Sulaiman alayhi salam and praying in that direction. But he never made it mandatory on the Jewish people, nor is there any, any verses of the Bible or anywhere else that it mandates that they must pray in that direction. There's a lot of, for example, different denominations of Christianity that no matter where they are in the world, they pray towards the East. Different Christian groups, they pray just towards the East, that's just what they do. Okay? But even for the Jewish people, there's no, we call it ijma, right? There's no confusion. Whether you're a Muslim from China, or you're a Muslim from Australia or America, you're gonna pray towards the Kaaba. And the reason is very clear. Ibrahim alayhi salam built it. And Ibrahim alayhi salam made it a center for all people. There's no confusion. It's made very, very straightforward. There is no such straightforward instruction for Masjid Aqsa. Even there's not a single hadith of the Prophet ﷺ pray in that direction. There's some narrations that he used to pray in that direction without saying anything. He was just doing it and we assume Allah revealed to him, continue that practice for now. And then I will make it towards the Kaaba. That's, that's all we assume. But there's no explicit statements. There's nothing. But now Allah has guided to a straight path, which is built on a straight, very clear argument. Because the previous passage of the surah is clearly demonstrating why is the Kaaba the right place to pray? Why is the Kaaba the right direction to pray? Because of Ibrahim alayhi salam and how he built it. يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ So that's one of the implications of Sirat Mustaqim. The second implication of Sirat Mustaqim that I'd like to highlight, very, it's tough to understand. The Muslims were praying towards Jerusalem. There are two communities of Muslims, Muhajirun and what? Muhajirun and Ansar. Now Muhajirun are from Mecca. And when they were in Mecca, even before Islam, their loyalty was to Aqsa or their loyalty was to the Kaaba. It's to the Kaaba because they're people of Mecca. 
Now when they come to Medina, even they have to turn their back towards Mecca, the home that they love. The home that they love. On the other hand, the, the, you know, the Ansar, some of them are of Jewish background, Christian background, their loyalty is towards what? Towards Jerusalem. And now what Allah Azza wa has done is He's focused everybody's attention back towards what? Mecca. Everybody's now focused back towards Mecca. The Muslims have just escaped Mecca. They were almost killed in Mecca. They finally come to Medina and they can breathe. Relief. But when Allah turns their direction in prayer towards Mecca, they realize something. We have to go back to Mecca. We can't stay in Medina. Because we're praying towards what? Mecca. Can you imagine praying towards the Kaaba and they're still idols? The only choice you have is you have to go clean up the masjid. You can't keep praying in that direction and let it be the way it is. Just by changing the Qibla, Allah gave the Muslims a mission. And the mission was, you will liberate the Kaaba. Is that clear to everybody? Because if this ayah didn't come, the Muslims don't have to worry about Makkah anymore. They can just live their life in Medina. And keep praying towards Jerusalem, no problem. Let the people of Makkah do what they do, who cares? But now that we have to pray in that direction, we have to purify Allah's house. We have to repeat what Allah told Ibrahim, Tahira bayti, purify my house. Now we have to purify that house. And that is a mission now that will have to go step by step by step. So if you understand that, everything that the Prophet did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after this, after this came, everything the Prophet did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was part of a mission to clean up the Kaaba again. The agenda, the mission became that Sirat Mustaqim. Straight, path, straight road back to Mecca. <laughs> That's what it became. And so the Muslims are clear that that is their mission now. يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ There's one more minor thing that I want to share with you, is about مَنْ يَشَاءُ The Jewish people believed that they are the special people of Allah, nobody can convert to their religion, it's theirs and theirs only, you have to be born into this religion, otherwise you cannot be part of this religion. And Allah says now, no, this is the religion of Ibrahim, that's why you face the house built by Ibrahim, and Ibrahim was worried about all the nations. The open invitation to whoever he wants. مَنْ يَشَاءْ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ He will guide whoever he wants to a straight path. He made this religion international. He made this religion beyond any ethnicity. When he said مَنْ يَشَاءْ Because this was not the way of the Jewish people. The Jewish people were exclusive. You see? But we are not exclusive. Islam is not a Malay thing. Islam is a South Indian thing too. Islam is a Chinese thing too. Islam is an Australian thing too, yeah, it is. Islam, is. Islam is across ethnicities. Islam is also for the people who aren't even Muslim yet. It's for them too. It's equal access. We have to ingrain this in our head. Because sometimes even for the Muslims, they have been Muslim for a few generations, and they feel like this is our thing. That is their religion, this is our religion. We're two different. No. This religion is not inherited. This religion is given by Allah and He gives it to whoever, whoever wants. And our job is to be the ambassadors of it. Okay? So now, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And that is how we made you into a nation. That is, كَذَلِكَ suggesting, كَذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا مَا يُقْصَدُ بِهَا تَثْبِيتُ مَا بَعْدَهَا Just, there's lots of meanings, I'll simplify them. One of them is, just like the Jews were made a nation before you, now you've been made a nation. Another meaning is, just because now the Kaaba is your direction, that is how you are made an Ummah. Because that is your mission. When that mission is fulfilled, and the Kaaba is cleaned up, then you will have fulfilled the mission of Ibrahim alayhi salam because Ibrahim built that house for the worship of Allah, not for the worship of idols. So you're gonna fulfill the mission of your father Ibrahim. That's what you're gonna do. This is why I keep calling it the religion of Ibrahim. Even the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu is actually tied back to the house built by Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay? Now, ذَلِكَ الْجَعْلَ الْبَدِيعَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ لَا جَعْلًا آخَرْ أَدْنَى مِنْهُ This, in this phenomenal way, this is one of the meanings of the ayah, in this amazing way, we made you into a nation. Not in any lesser way. 
We, the, the people of this ummah, it's incredible. There are people you will meet at the haram, you'll pe- Muslims you'll meet around the world, you'll see somebody praying at an airport somewhere, you don't even speak the same language as them, you don't eat the same food as them, you know nothing about them, you'll join them in salah and stand next to them. And you'll go in ruku at the same time and sujood at the same time. You are now joined with people just because of la ilaha illallah. You have nothing else in common. Nothing, nothing else in common. And that's enough. That's more than enough. Subhanallah. This is an amazing thing Allah has given us that He has never given any other people in the world. No other people have it like we do. Nobody else. You know, when I go in, in America, when I lived in New York, there are lots of different churches, of course, in New York. And, and in, in Texas, of course, there are lots of churches. But especially in New York, there was a Korean church, there was a Chinese church, there was a Filipino church, there was a Puerto Rican church, there was a Dominican church, there was a Mexican church, there was a you know, black church. It's not even Methodist church, and Presbyterian church, and Unitarian church, and Catholic church, and Orthodox church. I didn't mention different schools of thought, I mentioned different ethnicities. There are churches by ethnicities. But you're not supposed to have a Bangladeshi masjid, and a Pakistani masjid, and a Indian masjid. I know you have an Indian masjid in KL, I know. Masjid India, I know. <laughs> but it's not just for the Indians. It's just called Masjid India because there are lots of Indians in the neighborhood, not because they check at the door, hey, hold on, let me see your... Speak some Tamil, now go. No, they don't do that. <laughs> it's open. Then, then you see the same, same city, New York City, you go to a masjid. You, know, you go to Masjid Taqwa in Brooklyn, and you have the Senegalese, and you have the Chinese, and you have the you know, people that used to be Jewish became Muslim, and Pakistanis, and Indians, and all of it. I'm just standing in one row. Subhanallah. This is, um, this is how we were made into an ummah. But the, the thing I wanted to highlight for you, inshallah, is the word that describes this ummah. Ibrahim's word was ummatan muslimatan. Ummatan muslimatan. But Allah changed it. Allah said, not just ummatan muslimatan, now He gave it a new quality. He said, ummatan wasatan. It's a different word now. So you were expecting the same word again, ummatan muslimatan. Because that's what he asked for. But Allah added to ummatan muslimatan, and he added ummatan wasatan. Now the word wasat is actually very important for us to understand. So I'll, I'll give you some things about it. It's first of all, sara ma'na nifasa wal izza, nifasa wal izza wal khiyar min lawazimi ma'na al wasat urfan fa atlaquha ala al khiyar in nafis kinayatan. Let me just explain what that means in simple English. Wasat can mean the middle of something. Wasat is the middle of something. The thing is, what is in the middle of the castle? The most valuable things. The wall on the outside, the security guards, the, the gates, you know. And then all the way in the middle is the most valuable thing. Even the way Allah created the human being, right in the middle is the most valuable body part. Right in the middle. You understand? Same way when you have jewelry, the most valuable jewel is where? In the middle. If you have a necklace, the most valuable jewel goes right in the middle. So in the Arabic language, uh, and by the way, the, Ibn Ashun would even give the example of a valley. And the animals graze, 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 but they barely get to the middle, so the middle has the best fruits and best plants and you know, best vegetation. So the middle of something became known in Arabic as the best of something, the nicest of something, the most valuable of something. So in Arabic culture and in Arabic language, middle and the best and the climax and the most amazing are one and the same. When we are told ummatan wasata, its one meaning is a middle nation. But it's also an amazing nation, the most valuable nation, an incredible nation, a beautiful nation. You know, the best of all nations. It's all embedded inside the word wasat. What fascinates me even more, this is hard to understand, but I'll try to make it easy. Pay attention to this part, inshallah. Um, the, the wasatan, and I might even give you a short break so you can refresh your minds after this. The word wasat is what's called in Arabic a masdar. You know, in English, there's adjectives and there's ideas. An adjective is like blue or green or big or small. These are adjectives. But, you know, small is an adjective, but smallness Smallness is not an adjective, it's an idea. 
Similarly, high is an adjective, but highness is an idea. Similarly, middle is an adjective, but middleness is an idea. The idea of middle. Wasatan is actually not mutawasitan. Mutawasitatan would have meant middle, an adjective. But wasatan is an idea. And what that does is it changes the meaning significantly. What it suggests is that these, this ummah, Allah has made this ummah, when people don't understand what middle means, what balance means, what beautiful means, they don't understand that idea, when they look at this ummah, they get the definition of that idea. It's like that idea, because ideas are abstract, they're not, they're not easy to quantify. We will become the living example of what it means to be balanced. We will be that. Or that is the expl- that's the expectation of Allah. SubhanAllah, that is a huge expectation and we're doing a terrible job. We're not doing a good job at all. As I leave you with this first break, I'd like to share with you what, what wasatan could imply. What does it mean that we're the most amazing, balanced, middle people? What does that mean? There are nations before us, they were only interested with matters of knowledge. And their hearts became hard. There were other nations who cared only about the matter of the heart, and they had no knowledge. The Jewish people, lots of knowledge, but hearts became hard. The Christian people, lots of heart, but no knowledge. And the ummah is what? Wasat. It's in between the two. This book, it opens up our minds and it melts our hearts, doesn't it? This ummah is supposed to be spiritual and intellectual at the same time. And we're supposed to constantly balance between these two. There were people before us who were very good in theory but not good in practice. There was was ilm but no amal. Or there was amal and no ilm. We are supposed to be the people of ilm and amal balanced together, we're right in between. We're right in between those two extremes. We are people that are, there are people who only concern themselves with dunya. There are people who only concern themselves with akhirah. What about this ummah? Do we only care about akhirah? Do we only care about dunya? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana. We are right in between. We're right in between. Allah wants us to have the best of this dunya and the best of the akhirah. Right in between. In every sense of the word. And by the way, I would even argue, this ummah is supposed to be, there are, there are two kinds of knowledge. There's knowledge of deen and knowledge of dunya. I'll say that again. Knowledge of deen and knowledge of dunya. You have engineers, you have physicians, you have accountants, you have you know, different professions. These are people that have knowledge of dunya. You have muhaddithun and fuqaha and mufassirun and you know, people of kalam, these are knowledge of deen. We're supposed to be the people in between. Meaning we don't just learn our deen, we also learn dunya. And we don't just learn dunya, we also learn our deen. So this is supposed to be the ummah where the religious scholars know a lot about the world. And it's also supposed to be the ummah where the scientists and the political scientists and the thinkers and the sociologists know a lot about the religion. They're both, they work together. They're not two different worlds. What has happened? You have an Islamic university. They just study Islam. And then you have an engineering school or a medical school and that's all they study. And they're two different worlds. And people come out of one of them and they know a lot about this world, but they know nothing about that world. And the people in this world know everything here, but they know nothing about that side. We're supposed to be the people that are the best of both. There's, these, are, these two worlds are supposed to be in conversation. You see how far we've come from that? When somebody, today some young, young people come to me and say, Oh, I don't want to study science anymore. I want to study my deen. And I say, Ya Allah. When you're studying science, that's also your deen. That's also your deen. Why do you think that's like you're studying shaitan or something? What's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with studying science. There's nothing wrong with studying accounting or finance. We are that balanced people in everything that we do. In everything that we do. It's incredible. You know, I'll, I'll mention one or two more examples of, of the middle. There are nations, you know, like, like for example communism, right? Ideologies. 
where they think about the society and they don't think about the individual. Right? So the individual has been eliminated and everything is about the greater good, the larger society. Then of course the opposite is something like consumerism, capitalism, where the only thing that matters is the individual. Who cares about what? Society. So long as I have what I want, who cares about anybody else? Right? What does this deen teach us? You have to care about yourself, and you have to care about the world around you, and you have to balance between both, both of them. You have to balance between both of them. In every sense of the word, Allah made us ummatan wasata. And where will you learn that balance? You will learn that balance when you understand the role of Ibrahim alayhi salam in this religion. We keep going back to that one point, turn back towards this, this Kaaba will remind us of something. It will give us something. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And with that inshaAllah ta'ala, I'll give you your first break. It'll be about eight minutes long. And then we'll wrap up this dars. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I will, I will just be here. Oh, I'll take this. This is a nice chair. I'll sit on that nice chair. You can come up and ask me questions. I don't want to do questions on the mic. So you can come up, you can chat, and then we can reconvene right after this short break, okay? It's okay for me to continue? We're okay? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Anbiya wa al-Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een thumma amma ba'd fa a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim wa kathalika ja'alnakum ummatan wa sata li takunu shuhada'a ala al-nas wa yakuna al-rasulu alaykum shahida Rabbi shrach li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqtatan bil lisani yakahu qawli amin ya Rabbil Alameen thumma amma ba'd This is the uh, scary part of what I want to share with you today the, the, the nature of the responsibility on the one hand, it sounds like Allah has given us an amazing honor, calling us the middle nation, or a, a nation that represents balance and the best of all things in every way. But it's not that simple. We were not just given this responsibility, or this amazing badge, this honor, this medal, and then that's it, congratulations. He says, لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So that you may all be witnesses against humanity. You may be witnesses against humanity. This means a lot of things. So I want to go one by one. What does it mean that we, the Muslims, are witnesses against humanity? The first of them. عَلَى إِشَارَةٌ إِلَىٰ أَنَّ مُعْظَمَ شَهَادَةِ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ وَأَهَمِّهَا شَهَادَتُهُمْ عَلَى الْمُعْرِضِينَ لِأَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ قَدْ شَهِدَ لَهُمْ إِيمَانُهُمْ We are going to testify against all the non-Muslims on Judgment Day. We will testify against them. But what does that mean? See the Prophets, alayhi salatu was salam, all of them, Musa, Isa, Muhammad, وسلم, all of them were sent as a witness. Like even our Prophet was told, Inna arsalnaka shahidan. We sent you as a witness. For a Prophet to be a witness, two things have to happen. He has to clearly give a message, number one, and he has to clearly live that message, number two. I'll say that again. He has to give the message and what? Live the message. If you say good things, but you don't do good things, if I tell my children, pray, they say, oh boy, you don't pray, why should I pray? I say good things, but I don't do good things, it has no value. It has no, it has, it carries no weight. I can only say good things, and it means something if I do good things. Prophets were a witness against their people because they didn't just give them the theory. Be kind, be just, be honest, be truthful. You know, they didn't give those values in words, in speeches. But when they look at these, these prophets' personal lives, when you go inside their homes, when you see their business dealings, when you see their, how they treat their neighbor, and how they are in their every day, everything that they do, you could see that they live it first and then they give it. That's when they become a witness. This ummah is supposed to be a witness against all of humanity. Which, we, which means we have to be clear in giving them a message. And we also have to be clear in living the message. So they see us and they see justice. They see us and they see a people who have no racism. They see us and they see people that have no classism. The wealthy are not treated better than the poor. One race is not treated better than another. They see us and they don't see any corruption. They see us and they, 
They see honesty in every one of our business practices. They see us and they see people who when they give a promise, they fulfill a promise. We think da'wah means you hand somebody a brochure that says Allah is one. You hand somebody a pamphlet or give them a video or they just get the message. That's just one part of shahada. If you want the hujjah on them, they have, you, you have to give the message and you have to live it too. That's when you become shaheed. When Allah says, لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ You know what that means? That means you must now live the teachings of this book. You must be a living model, each of you, of this book. And then you can preach the message of this book. I'll tell you one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in my life. One of the most depressing experiences of my life. You'll be surprised. It was Hajj. Hajj, and I've only done one Hajj. And it's supposed to be the most joyous occasion of my life. And I was very depressed. Eventually I was happy. But I was very depressed. You know why I was depressed? Because there were VIP sections. I was depressed because there were people with a different kind of passport treated differently. I was depressed because, you know, people were not concerned about each other at all. If you wanted to take somebody and say, if you told somebody, Islam, in Islam, everybody is treated equally. In Islam, the wealthy and the poor, and the black and the white, they're all the same. We are all slaves of Allah. That's the beauty of Islam. That's why Bilal accepted Islam. And he could stand next to Umar and pray. And I give them all that theory, and I say, let me show you Islam, and I take them to Hajj. <laughs> this? This is your Islam? Seriously? Am I, maybe I have bad eyesight, or maybe this is a different religion or something. Where in the world am I going to take them? And I show them that people are, the, the ummah is what it's supposed to be. That we live it. Until we become models of it, please listen to this. I know it's controversial, I, I may get in trouble for it. I don't care, this is what I'm convinced of. Until we, the ummah, are a model of, the, of this deen, we don't get to hate the kuffar. We don't get to say, ah, these kuffar, they're gonna go to Jahannam. Ah, who cares about astaghfirullah, these people worship. I don't, what, are you, what have you shown them? What have I shown them? You know, talk is half the equation. The living model is the other half. That's what the prophets were. The prophets were not all talk. The prophets were not great speeches. They were living examples. You know? Before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a Rasul. What was he called by the people? A sadiq, al amin. You guys know this, right? True, honest. Is that the first qualities people know about the Muslim Ummah today? <laughs> Think about that. Before the Prophet was even given the responsibility to do da'wah, he proved his credibility. That is his shahada. Because that's when, when he taught Islam, people said, we have to listen, he's an honest man. He's the most truthful man I know. Obviously this is the right religion. You know? Today you find those good qualities, non-Muslims have them. Way more than the Muslims have them. It's a shame. It's a shame. And we have to be the ambassadors of those qualities. We are too obsessed with preaching Islam and not living it. When we think about da'wah. And that's, that may be da'wah, but it's not shahada ala nas. Because the shahada means what? Witnessing. People saw you, people saw what you're like, and then they still rejected. Then you get to say to Allah, Ya Allah, we tried to live by your deen. We tried to stay away from the haram, abide by the halal. We did justice every, every way we could. And then we also gave them the message of Islam, and Ya Allah, they didn't listen. Then we have a case. And by the way, think about the opposite. As Mawludi rahimahullah put it, think about the opposite. If we don't do this, if we don't become witnesses over humanity, in the way that we're supposed to, and we come in front of Allah on Judgment Day, and the neighbors that we had, the Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, atheist, agnost, neighbors that we had, stand in front of Allah on Judgment Day and say, Ya Allah, I had no idea what is Islam. 
And Allah will say, didn't Abdul Karim next, live next door? And Abdul Karim says, yeah, right here. Abdul Karim, they're saying they didn't know Islam. But you live next door. Yeah, but I owned a liquor store and uh, we used to go to movies together. They don't know any Islam from you. They just know, don't do business with Abdul Karim because he's a shady guy. How are they going to know Islam from you? Because you gave them some iftar in Ramadan, that's how they know Islam from you? Who's in trouble now? Is this guy in trouble more or this Abdul Karim in trouble? Do you understand what's happening here? If this is a huge burden put on this ummah, now we will be standing trial before Allah Azza wa Jal. Because the people will say, Islam is beautiful but not the ummah. <laughs> Islam is amazing but how would I know? How in the world would I know? You know? That's the takunu shuhada ala nas. And anas, all people. Which means whichever culture we belong to, whichever nation we belong to, Islam can be practiced there. Islam can survive as a minority and a majority. Islam can survive when you're the only Muslim in the village. Islam can survive when you're one million people and the other one is one to two people. Islam is not dependent on numbers. It's not. It's not dependent on environment. You will be witness to humanity no matter what situation, no matter what environment. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى نَاسِ You know what this also taught us? This ayah, this ayah taught us we cannot stay among ourselves. We cannot stay Muslim among Muslim only. Muslims have to deal with Hindus, they have to deal with Buddhists, they have to deal with people of other religions, they have to interact with them, they have to share concern with them. Because they're people of Ibrahim, Ibrahim never stayed in one place, did he? Always dealing with other people? Always concerned about other people? You know what, Ibrahim, anybody here know what Ibrahim salam did with the people of Lut? The angels came to Ibrahim first, and he said, why are you here? They said, we are going to kill everyone in the nation of who? Lut. Ibrahim said, oh, they're gay, right? Yeah, kill them. What did Ibrahim do? He argued on their behalf. If it was one of us, we're like, Alhamdulillah, finally. Is it going to be nuclear? And Ibrahim is, يُجَادِلُنَا فِي قَوْمِ لوت. We are مِلَّةَ تَبِيكُمْ Ibrahim, we are supposed to be a mercy and a source of da'wah to all people. All people. Can you imagine how far we've come from that? How far away we are from that deen? So that's the first impl implication. Then l listen to this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Abi Sa'id al-Khudri. يُجَاءَ بِنُوح يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Amazing hadith. Nuh will be brought on Judgment Day. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ هَلْ بَلَّغْتْ He will be asked, Did you deliver the message? Who is being asked? Nuh alayhi salam. Did you deliver the message? فَيَقُولْ نَعَمْ يَا رَبْ He will say, Yes, Master. I did. I, did, I delivered the message. فَتُسْأَلُ أُمَّتُهُ Then his nation will be asked, هَلْ بَلَّغَكُمْ did the message reach you? فَيَقُولُونَ مَا جَاءَنَا مِن نَذِيرٌ They're gonna say, no, nobody came warning us. Nuh is saying, I did my job. His entire nation says, no, what are you talking about? We didn't have any warner. We didn't have any messenger. فَيَقُولْ مَنْ شُهُودُكْ Allah will say to Nuh, do you have any witnesses that can prove that you're telling the truth? Allah is asking who now? Nuh. And Nuh answers, فَيَقُولُوا مُحَمَّدٌ وَأُمَّتُهُ He says, yes, the people that will make, defend me, will be Muhammad and his ummah. Muhammad and us, us on judgment day. We never met Nuh alayhi salam. But did we recite Surah Nuh? <laughs> did we recite Ayat of Nuh? Did we know that he delivered the message? This Qur'an, we believe it? And so he says, then Allah will bring all of you and you will all testify. Yes, Nuh delivered the message. We learned that in Quran. Allah made us a witness against the people of Nuh on the day of judgment. Even against them. We're not just a witness against the people who live in our time, we're even a witness against the criminals of all history. And it also means we are witness in favor of all of the believers of the past. I'll give you just one example. Shahada ala nas Ashab al-Kahf. You guys know the famous story, right? Ashab al-Kahf. If the Quran did not teach Ashab al-Kahf, 
These fitya, these young people. Everybody in the world would have believed that these are Christian saints who believed in the worship of Jesus. That's what the whole world would have believed. That these were saints. There's a church in their name still. Their church is in their name. Jacobite churches. Nobody came to testify and say that these were believing men. These believers were good men and they didn't do any shirk. They stood by Allah except Qur'an. And through Qur'an this ummah testifies for them. We're the ones who came to defend them. This Qur'an, through this Qur'an, we will testify for all the believers who have ever lived in history, which nobody knows about. And we will be their witnesses. We will be their backup. This is subhanAllah, rahmatan lil alameen. The messenger is, is a rahmah for all the nations of the world in the future and in the past. Even in the past, subhanAllah. Even for people that we've never heard of. You know, people in history that are, we don't know where they're buried. But they believed in La ilaha illallah, we will testify for them. This, this ummah is so honored, subhanAllah. So now, the Rasul ﷺ says, ثُمَّ قَرَأَ وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ The Prophet said this hadith about, you will testify for the people of Nuh, then he recited this ayah, he made you a middle nation, so you can be witness against all of humanity. And then he described, وَسَطًا قَالَ عَدْلًا he said, Wasatan means you will be a witness that can be relied upon. You are reliable witnesses. يُعْتَمَدُ عَلَيْهِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا This is the hardest part. You were made a balanced nation, so you can testify against all of humanity. And also so that the messenger can testify against you. Rasulullah wasallam can testify against you. This is a very difficult concept. This is several things. I'll, I'll start with the first one. If we, I want you to imagine the court of Allah is three parts. The people, one side. The ummah, in the middle. And Rasulullah on that side. It's three sides. Who's in the middle? We are. In a sense, we are between the people and the messenger. How is the messenger supposed to reach the people? With who? People in the middle. He's gone. The only thing left of him is this ummah. We are a reflection of Rasulullah wasallam on this earth. So in a sense, we are wasat also because we are in between Rasul wasallam on this side and humanity on that side. And on judgment day, all of them are standing. All of them are there. Rasul wasallam is there. The ummah is there. Humanity is there. And humanity says they didn't do their job. They never taught us. They never showed us. And on the other side, Rasul wasallam is testifying. They didn't do their job. We are already in trouble with humanity side. Now we're in extra trouble from which side? The Rasul side, sallallahu alayhi wa Our messenger, alayhi salatu wa we learn about him that on judgment day, he does shafa'a for the sunnah. Ummati, ummati, multiple times, multiple times. But that's not the only testimony on judgment day. A lot of times the Muslims, we, we highlight, and when I teach Ayatul Kursi, I, I highlight the Shafa'a of Rasulullah wasallam and how he's going to make a case for all of us to enter Jannah, and may Allah make us of those that are worthy of the Shafa'a, of the plea of the Messenger of Allah wasallam. But that's not the only testimony on the Day of Judgment from the Prophet. We have to know all of them. What's the other one? فَالْيُذَادَانُ قَوْمٌ أَخْوَامٌ حَتَّى عَنْ حَوْضِ People are going, you know the Hawd of the Prophet Sallallahu the river? Where we drink from? Al Kawthar? The Hawd? There are people, Muslims are trying to drink from the Hawd. They're coming on judgment day to drink from the river. And there are angels pushing them away. Get away, get away, get away. No access for you. So there's people that are fighting to try to get to the river and they can't get access. So Rasul says, Ummati! Ya Rab, Ummati! Master, this is my people. Let them, they're Muslims, let them come drink. فَيُقَالِ إِنَّكَ لَا تَدْرِي مَا أَحْدَثُوا بعدك. He will be told, you don't know what they did after you were gone. You don't know what trouble they caused. And what does he say? إِنَّهُمْ بَدَّلُوا وَغَيَّرُوا They replaced. They changed. They made changes. فَأَقُولُ سُحْقًا سُحْقًا لِمَنْ بَدَّلَ بَعْدِي Then I will say, take them far away, take them far away. Anybody who made changes after I was gone. 
A second ago, he was saying, Ummati, Ummati. A second later, Rasulullah is saying, Take them away, take them away. Get them out, because they were not shuhada ala nas. They changed. This is our identity as an ummah. What does it mean to be an ummah? It means to be shuhada ala nas. What does it mean to be an ummah? Ar Rasul alaykum shaheed. Rasul Sallallahu will be with you. Don't forget that. Fi sahih annahu lamma wujiha Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ila al-qibla qalu ya Rasulullah kayfa bil ladhina matu Actually even before, that's, that's later on. I'll tell you that later on. Wa yakuna Rasulu alaykum shahida I, I'd like you to remember that we on the day of judgment there's a, there's a, a ayah of, of Quran very difficult ayah to swallow. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا The Rasul will say on that day, this nation of mine, they abandoned the Qur'an. They abandoned the Qur'an. And Mufassirun say this refers to Quraysh. Quraysh abandoned the Qur'an. But others say, no, it says, اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا Like, it's an ironic language. It's they held on to this Qur'an as something to be left alone. How do you hold on to something, اتَّخَذُوا, and then leave it alone? The best example of this I can find is in our cultures. We hold on to the Qur'an, we recite the Qur'an, we print it in beautiful, colorful, glossy print. We love uh, you know, uh, calligraphy of the Qur'an, tajweed of the Qur'an. We love these things, but the message of the Qur'an, ah, <laughs> easy. Qira'ah of the Qur'an, yes. Beautiful art of the Qur'an, two thumbs up. But don't, don't talk about riba, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Don't talk about, you know, its teachings. Don't talk about justice. Don't, don't, don't go there, no, no, no. Just recite, just recite beautifully. Oh, mashallah, your tajweed. Mm-mm, so good. We hold on to it and abandon it at the same time. Isn't it? اِتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا May Allah not make us of those people. Because when Rasulullah testifies, uh, well, who's, who's left? Who's left? The day on which nobody gets to speak, only Rasulullah speaks sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if he speaks against you, then there's nothing left. Then there's nothing left. It's a scary position the ummah is in. Those of us in the ummah that are awake, there are two kinds of members of this ummah. There's members of this ummah that are sleeping, and there's members of this ummah that are awake. I would argue those of the ummah that are awake, they better really wake up. We better really wake up. We have a huge responsibility on our shoulders. Huge responsibility on our shoulders. And we, we have to carry this responsibility. We don't have a choice. And it will not be carried with anger. I cannot be yelling at the Muslims that are sleeping. I can't. Even they deserve mercy. They, des they deserve rahmah. That's not how they're going to wake up. You know? We have to follow the way of Ibrahim salam in waking people up with love and mercy and care. This is just a, a brief analysis of لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ, عليكم شَهِيدًا As I go on, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولُ مِمَّنْ يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ So awesome. And we didn't make the Qibla that you used to be committed to, meaning Jerusalem. We, only, we put that there only for one reason, to get to know, to test, who will actually follow the Messenger, and who will turn back on his heels and go away. I told you earlier on, there are two groups, Muhajirun and Ansar. Muhajirun love Kaaba. A lot of the Ansar love Jerusalem. When the Muslims move to Medina, who is being tested? The Muhajirun, because they have to put their back to the Kaaba. When the ayah came, you have to pray towards Makkah, who is being tested? The, the, the Ansar, who have affiliation to Jerusalem. So in this way, both groups got tested. To Allah, testing whether they will obey Allah was more important, the direction of prayer was less important. Allah could have made the direction of the Kaaba, the Makkah, from the first ayat of the Qur'an. Why did He wait this long? Why did He wait this long? This is so important. Salah is so important. Aqimu Salah is it's so early in the Qur'an. Why not just tell the Prophet from the beginning, pray towards the Kaaba? He waited until he could test both groups, the people of Makkah and the people of Medina. Because the, the importance is not the direction of prayer, the importance is the command of Allah. That's what's, what actually matters. So now when he does this, the, you know, uh, notice by the way the language, it's so beautiful. We didn't change the, the, the direction of the Qibla, 
except we could see who will actually follow the Messenger. مِمَّنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولِ Rasul Sallallahu doesn't even explain himself. He prays towards Jerusalem. Nobody comes and asks him, Ya Rasulullah, why aren't we praying towards the Kaaba? Or when we're praying towards the Kaaba, he doesn't, nobody comes and asks him, why are we praying towards the Kaaba? Why aren't we praying towards Jerusalem anymore? The ayat hadn't even come yet. It seems to be the case that the ayahs hadn't even come yet and the Prophet was already praying in the, towards the Kaaba. Then the ayat came. Because that's why the fools will come and say, hey, what happened? Revelation hasn't even come yet. But the, the change has already happened. Now, when they turn their heels, مِمَّا يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ حَقِبَيْ In Qur'an, when somebody turns on their heels, it means they turn around and they run away. When you say turn around and run away, it means like run away from the battlefield, right? Qur'an uses that expression here to describe there are people who will turn around and run away because they don't want to follow the right direction of the Qibla. So it's literally, it's playing on the direction of the Qibla and the idea that they are retreating from Islam. إِلَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ هَدَ اللَّهِ But the only people who will able, be able to follow this instruction is the ones Allah guided. إِلَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ And it's going to be too big of a problem. إِن كَانَتْ لَكَ بِيرَةً It's going to be too big of a change. Except for those who Allah has guided. I would like to, as I, as I teach these ayat, what I like to emphasize is how does this apply to you and me today? Because Qibla already changed, alhamdulillah. It's not difficult for you to say, oh, no Jerusalem anymore, I guess I'm going to pray towards Kaaba. That problem is solved for you and me. But what do these ayat mean for you and me today? Here's what they mean. Sometimes you and I are learning about Islam. Actually, sometimes you and I are not learning about Islam. We hear things and we follow them since childhood. And later on in your life, you actually learn that that wasn't Islam. Later on in your life, you learn that there's something else. You're supposed to do something differently. Does that happen to you? When that happens to you, and you say, no, no, I'm not gonna do things the old way anymore. I'll do them this because I studied this and I learned this, I'm gonna follow this. Everybody in your family says what? You're crazy? What happened to you? Why are you becoming so extreme? All of us do it this way. Oh, we're all wrong? Everybody's wrong now? Your grandfather was wrong too? His father was wrong too? And you're sitting there going, no, sorry. Because now you have to see, do you, do you follow your family? Because they're Muslim too. Or do you follow what you studied, what you learned? This is gonna get you in big trouble. So people came to the, the Sahaba, and they said this. Uh, and actually when the direction was changed, some Sahaba came to the Prophet, and they said this. فَكَيْفَ بِالَّذِينَ مَاتُوا وَهُمْ يُصَلُّونَ إِلَى بَيْتِ الْمَقْدِسِ Ya Rasulullah, there were lots of people who used to pray towards Jerusalem, and they died. So they were praying towards the wrong GPS direction. Their salah didn't count. What about them? And then what about all of our prayers? We were praying in these many years, we were praying towards Jerusalem. If that was wrong, none of those prayers counted. And so when that came, that, that distinction came, Allah Azza wa revealed, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ Allah will not ever be someone who wastes your iman. Allah will not waste your iman. It's beautiful, isn't it? They said our prayers are wasted. Allah didn't say Allah will not waste your prayer. Allah said Allah will not waste your iman. Because prayer is only valuable when you pray with iman. The direction was less important. Somebody stuck in the middle of the dark at night in the desert somewhere and they have to pray and their, their phone has no service so the app for the Qibla is not working. You know, they don't have a compass and nothing. They're like, Ya Allah, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? They're like, eeny, meeny, miny, kaaba. And they just... And then later on when they, you know, when they find out, they pray towards Disney World, instead of the kaaba. Did their prayer count or no? Did it count or no? You know why it counted? Because they prayed with what? Iman. The other beautiful thing here is salah is iman to Allah. To Allah, there's no difference between Salah and Iman. That should tell you how important Salah is. Because no Salah to Allah is the same as no Iman. Oh man, that's heavy. That's a, don't use that on your children. That's for you and for me. The state of your Salah is the state of your Iman. When you don't give a lot of value to your Salah, you're not giving a lot of value to your 
iman. When you take care of your salah, you're taking care of your iman. No difference between the two. This is why وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِعَ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah will never waste your iman. Your iman, direction is not dependent on it. وَإِنْ كَانَتْ لَكَبِيرَةً إِلَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ هَدَى اللَّهُ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِعَ إِمَانَكُمْ But what about the people, and this is إِمَانَكُمْ Your iman, the people who asked the question. But they asked the question about people who died a long time ago. But the answer is Allah will not waste your iman. But what about their iman? So Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِالنَّاسِ لَرَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah, in regards to all people, has always been رَؤُوفُ rahim, Has always been extremely compassionate, always been loving, always been caring, has always known what they're going through. I take you back to that one example because it's my favorite example, the people of the cave. In my studies, I am convinced that Ashab al-Kahf had no idea of any prophets. They had no idea about any prophets or any book. All they knew was, idol worship is wrong, there can only be one God. That's all they knew. And they made up their prayers. You guide us, you tell us what to do. We don't know what to do. Was that good enough for Allah too? Yeah. Allah didn't say, well, they didn't even make wudu before they asked me. They don't even have ijazah in tajweed. He didn't care. Because in Allah bin nas la ra'uf rahim Allah is compassionate, caring, understanding, loving and merciful to all people across the board. He spares them. Don't think Allah is ready to punish. We have unfortunately for a lot of people in the religion, this happened to the people before us, the Jews, they became very strict. And they used to make it look like, sound like Allah will punish you at every turn. Oh, you did this wrong, Allah will punish you. You did that, oh, Allah will punish you. You know? Somebody, somebody came to the masjid after many years, they made wudu, they missed a few drops, and you're like, oh, this guy, his salah is not gonna count. So sad, he's gonna burn. Don't do that. We, this, is, this is the teaching here. Even if they were praying in the entirely wrong direction, in Allah bin nasi la ra'ufur rahim. Finally, the ayah. Man, I, I gotta tell you this. You guys know the story of Musa alayhi salam, right? When Musa alayhi salam spoke with Allah, Allah told him to go to Fir'aun. And when he, when he told him to go to Fir'aun, he made a list of problems. Musa made a list of problems. He said, you know, إِنِّي أَخَافُ وَنْ يَقْتُلُونَ وَيَضِيقُ الصَّدْرِ وَلَا يَنْتَلِقُ لِسَانِ فَأَرْسِلِ اللَّهَ هَرُونَ وَهُمْ عَلَيَّ ذَنبٌ لَهُمْ عَلَيَّ ذَنبٌ You know, يُكَذِّبُونَ and then يَقْتُلُونَ They will call me a liar. They're going, my tongue doesn't move, I become frustrated, I can't speak properly. I need backup, I need help, could you give me Harun? They might even kill me before they let me speak. He made a list of problems. And then Allah answered him. What's beautiful about the ayah that we're about to read, is that Allah is also, just like He answered Musa, He's gonna answer Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But look at how He answers Rasulullah. قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ We saw your face turning towards the sky. And قَدْ نَرَى suggests the takfir, we keep seeing your face turning towards the sky. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wouldn't even ask. He didn't ask. He was just hurting in his heart that his back is towards the house of his father Ibrahim. So he would just, just kind of look at the sky. And the other beautiful thing is, تَقَلُّبُ wajhika means your face itself turned. Instead of you turned your face, the face itself turned. You know sometimes you do a, a body action and you can't even control it. You hear a sound and you just go like that. And you didn't even intend to do that. You just, reaction. It's suggesting the Prophet ﷺ can't even help himself. Every now and then he just... You know, every time he's about to pray, and he's not facing the Qibla, he's just, his eyes just go into the sky, his face just goes into the sky. And Allah says, he noticed. He noticed that you have that reaction. So you don't have to ask. Every time you turn your face into the sky. تَرْضَاهَا Then we are, we swear to it, therefore, that we are absolutely turning you without a doubt, without a doubt, in a, in a direction that makes you happy, that pleases you. This is the ayah, <coughs> it's the only ayah of the actual reason for the change of the Qibla. 
you have later, you know, all around we've learned it was the house built by Ibrahim alayhi salam. Later on Allah will command, turn in its direction. But the first reason Allah gave openly was that the Prophet sallallahu was sad. And now to make him happy, I'm changing the direction. In a direction that makes you happy. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What a maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu That the reason we pray towards the Qibla is it pleases Rasulullah sallallahu So, so beautiful. And by the way, the happiness of our Prophet is the same as the happiness of Allah. Because when the Kaaba was finally cleaned up, رَضِيتُ لَكُمْ بُنِسْلَامَ دِينَ The same verbiage was used. You know, I've, I, I'm pleased with for you as Islam is your religion. Now the thing that I'd like to highlight here, remember I told you the Prophet will testify against us? Or for us before? Think about this. Allah changed the Qibla for him. Did he even have to ask? No. Allah changed the Qibla. And on Judgment Day, he'll actually ask. How heavy is that? How heavy a burden is that? So we, we have to know, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ We're dealing with the Messenger of Allah وسلم. It's not a light matter. فَوَلِّي وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ Turn your face then in the direction of Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the sanctified masjid, the, you know, the, the sacred masjid. Now the term Al-Masjid Al-Haram was new. The Arabs did not use it. They used Al-Bayt, Al-Bayt Al-Atiq, Kaaba. These are known names. But the Qur'an used what phrase? Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Al-Masjid is a dharf from the word sajada, which means to do sajda. The place of sajda. So the, the, the official name of the Kaaba is Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Al-Masjid Al-Haram. That's in the Qur'an, right? Now why is that important? There are lots of things we do at the Masjid, at, 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 at Kaaba. We do tawaf, we do i'tikaf, we do salah. But in the word Masjid, which act is highlighted? Which is the most important act? Sajda. Because from it comes the word masjid, right? Now why is sajda important? Go back. The first battle, that's the first story that's mentioned in the Qur'an here, is a story of Adam, which was a problem of what? Refusal to do sajda. We are the final soldiers of that battle. And when do you win that battle against shaitan? When you fall into sajda. Because when you fall into sajda, you do the opposite of what shaitan did. You do the opposite of what shaitan did. And now the house that is supposed to be there so that humanity until the day of judgment can do sajda, that's the house that you are now to pray in direction of. That is your mission. Subhanallah. So profound by calling it al-masjid al-haram. The sacred place of doing sajda. The sanctified place of doing sajda. وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ And wherever you may be, فَوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَهُ Then you should turn your faces in its direction. The first part of it was for Rasulullah Wherever you must turn towards the Qibla, towards Al-Bashd al-Haram, then he turns to the Ummah and says, by the way, you also. All of you also turn towards it. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ لَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ No doubt about it. Those who were given the book, they know that it is the truth from their master. They also know that this is the right Qibla. I'll give you one example of that from the Qur'an that should be enough. How do the Christians and Jews, especially the Jews, how do they know that this is the Kaaba? For them, which was, Kaaba had no value, which, which place had value? Jerusalem. Quran says they know. How do they know? For the Jews, who's the most important prophet? Do you know? Hmm? Torah given to who? Musa. I'll tell you something about Musa. Musa accidentally killed a person. He punched somebody and he died. Then he ran away to Egypt, from Egypt to Madian. He ran away from Egypt to where? Madian. Madian is Arab. Madian is Arab land. When he went to Madian, he got married. You know this, right? When he got married, he married a, 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 an old man's daughter from Madian, which means he married an Arab. Which is pretty awesome. When you, I talked to my Jewish friends, it was like, Moses married Arab. But his kids are like, you know, half Arab. And according to some of them, ethnicity comes from the mother. So I'm like, his kids are Arab according to you. <laughs> but anyway, when he did marry, in Madian, you know his father said, the, the girl's father said, you must work for me for eight years. Or you could do ten. Eight years or you could do ten. You know how he said it? 
أن تأجرني ثمانية حجج. You will work for me for eight hajj. Eight hajj. Or you could do ten hajj. How many hajj do we do in a year? One. Which land was this? Uh, Arab land, yes or no? Arab land. And in the Arab land, an Arab old man says, you will work for me for ten, for ten hajj. When you say the word hajj, what location are you making reference to? Jerusalem? Has hajj ever been done in Jerusalem? Hajj is being done around the Kaaba since the time of Ibrahim a.s. When he says eight or eight or ten hajj, he's telling Musa a.s. about the Kaaba. And Musa a.s. himself knows about the Kaaba. And why wouldn't he? He lived among a believer, within a believer in the Arab land, from the children of Ibrahim a.s. Why wouldn't he know? Subhanallah. They know. They know. And Qur'an gives us hints that they know, even though they buried it away. You know, when I was reading Hamiduddin Farahi's book on Ar-Ra'yu Sahih, fi man huwa about how much they know about the Kaaba or don't know, he said when they took, because they don't say Ismail was slaughtered, they say, you know, Ishaq was slaughtered. But we say Ismail was slaughtered. So they say he took Is- 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 Ishaq to the valley of Sakka, between Shifa and Mura, that's what the Jews say. A valley called Sakka, between Shifa and Mura. So they took Makkah and turned it into what? Sakka. And Safa and Marwa, what did they turn it into? Shifa and Mura. You're like, there's no Shifa Mura anywhere. There's no Sakka anywhere. Where, can, where is this valley? They changed a little bit spelling here and there. And from Makkah became Sakka, and Safa became Shifa, and Marwa became Mura. And <laughs> Subhanallah. They know. They know about the Kaaba. They know it was built by their father Ibrahim a.s. You know? So they, Allah says, لَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ They absolutely know that it is the truth from their master. وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah is not unaware of what they do. Allah knows full well what they do. I'd like to conclude inshaAllah ta'ala with the following. There are in Western Islamic studies, there are those who still question the Kaaba. They say, oh, the Arabs, they came up with their own sort of story about Abraham and... It has nothing to do with the Bible because since it's not in the Bible, it's not authentic. And you know, why would they even pray in that direction? They were better off praying towards Jerusalem. Allah's words become true even today. Sayaqulu sufaha umin al nas ma wallahum an qiblati himulati kanu alaiha. The fools among the people will say, why? What turned them away from the direction of Jerusalem towards Mecca? The fools will say they still say to this day. There's still PhDs, professors in universities are still saying the same thing to this day. And Qur'an is still commenting on them saying, سَيَقُولُ سُفَهَا أُمِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَاللَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمْ أَلَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا the, the, the heart of the, the, the lesson here that I wanted to come, you know, give across to you, inshaAllah ta'ala, is that, that the change of the qibla, it represents a huge shift in the way that we, the Muslim ummah thinks. We are not concerned about ourselves, we're concerned about all of humanity. And that is evidenced in the fact that we are the people of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So that's the, inshallah the crux of the lesson today. I hope you guys got something beneficial out of it. I would urge you to read these ayat yourselves. I'll hope to continue this series. This entire passage is from 142 to 152 actually. So we did it up to 144. There's a few more very heavy ayat left inshallah ta'ala to cover. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa zikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.